John Kerry is a big picture thinker who believes good design can make people feel valued, respected, honored, and seen. He regards architecture as a public good, not a public luxury, and says a lack of diversity among creatives has led to thoughtless, compassionless spaces. His TED Talk has had over a million views, and last fall, the Museum of Design Atlanta invited him to curate an exhibition based on his book, Design for Good, A New Architecture for Everyone. I'm Gail O'Neill. Join me and my producer, Felipe Barral, as we invite John Kerry, our very first guest, to talk about his vision as an ambassador for design that dignifies. All that coming up on this episode of Collective Knowledge, because spreading knowledge is the most altruistic thing we can do as human beings. Where do you think your fundamental desire to make connection comes from? Well, I really believe in relationships and so everything that I do is taking a kind of relationship based approach so I'm interested in getting to know people getting to understand how they feel what they need and how I can be of service and those are the the main things and I think if there's any one person that modeled that for me it's my father he's a 40-year nonprofit director uh, also the father of six children, um, so he was always uniquely attuned to a large group of people. And I've taken that work that he did at the local level in Milwaukee within the nonprofit sector, and I've tried to apply it to other places. And I think you triangulate that with the kind of design training that I've had that involves this like very visual, very detail-oriented uh, uh, awareness, and I've managed to um, you know, create something new, a, a kind of new type of career that I never could have imagined. It's been, it's been so interesting. Design for public good. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe that the big ideas that motivate us as adults have their seeds in our childhood. What were the ideas that kept you, maybe not kept you up at night when you were a child, but that captivated your imagination when you were growing up? Well, as a, a child um, with five siblings, all practicing the piano. Where are you in birth order? I'm the second oldest. Okay. So um, I also have my father's name, and I'm the tallest by about six inches. So I have always stuck out in a pretty significant way. Me too. I'm the only one that's left our home state. Uh, I have a sister actually that's in, in Illinois, but otherwise everyone's very close to home, and I am always on one coast or the other. And so, um, but as it related to my childhood, I was looking for quiet places to study and read and just think and I never felt like I had that and so even in high school my parents would be like just wait till you get to college it's gonna be so much louder than the dorms and I remember going to my first dormitory at the University of Minnesota where I went to undergrad and it was silent and I just remember like a big smile on my face being like this is what I've wanted and needed all this time. <laughs> that is beautiful. Okay, so 13 years after graduating from the University of Minnesota, you are invited back to be the commencement speaker. And to your credit, you tell the graduates the story of your first semester as a freshman in a Jesuit high school, which was not that stellar in terms of your GPA. Tell me how your fall from academic grace led to your saving grace, really. Well. I found um, these arts programs, which are not just in that case, but in so many cases, relegated to the basements of schools. They're, they're kind of chronically underfunded. That was what, that was my future right there. Arts and creativity and um, the kinds of things that, that are sometimes discounted. They can, certainly in my case, become so foundational and also they can, they can kind of reconnect us with our humanity. And so I was very lucky to find a teacher who identified that in me. So even though I wasn't good at the kind of memorization and other subjects, he managed to captivate me. You have said, I believe design functions like the soundtrack we're not even fully aware is playing. It sends us subconscious messages about how to feel and what to expect. How can design reinforce or undermine our dignity? Dignity is important to you. Dignity is. It's, it's not a term that I was ever trained to connect with design. Um, but the more that I learned about dignity, the more that I understood that they were intrinsically related. Um, and so dignity is, is something that I think as human beings we all seek. We sometimes, occasionally, 
get or feel. And in many cases, we don't have the ability to, to feel that way. We're kind of led to believe that we don't have control over the spaces that we inhabit, and we're, we're left with whatever we are given. And in so many cases, whether that's a social service agency that is running on a small budget and has not been aware of its space, or a public space like the DMV or one of these other places that feel dehumanizing. We can all kind of relate like, oh yeah, I've had that experience there. Um, you know, that, those, are, those are what I would call uh, undignified places. And so I've seen design's unique ability to make people feel valued and cared for, and that could be you know, a dynamic space, a clean space, a well-lit space, a well-ventilated space, just something that makes people aware that they are cared for and seen and respected. Mm -hmm. And um, design has that unique ability to do so because it is literally the container that we're living our lives in. And um, the, the better, more thoughtfully you know, made that container is, the better lives that we're going to lead. I couldn't agree more. You have two daughters, the okay. older of which is Maya. Yes. And you've talked about watching Maya. Is she a toddler now? So Maya's five years old now. Oh, Stella is two. OK. And they are the center of my universe. Okay. Yeah. Yes, as they should be. You've talked about watching Maya walk through spaces and respond to those spaces. But it seems at some point there's a cutoff for children where they stop responding to their physical environments or they stop, they stop demonstrating it. When does that happen and why do you think that happens? Well, I think that what we witness now with both Maya and Stella is uh, a playfulness. They are given so much freedom to play and to run around and to climb on things and to just like explore. And yet we've already entered Maya into a kind of uh, what we call a transitional kindergarten and we've seen that she literally is spending the majority of her day in a very small classroom that is colorful and that is you know, well cared for by her amazing teacher. But there is one small window, and those, those, that window is covered with blinds. So there's literally no natural light. Getting into my own daughter's classroom, and I know what natural light can do. It can make people feel connected with the outdoors. It can be a perfect substitute for the kind of bright fluorescent lighting that is more, uh, and you're kind of better fit for a big box retail store than it is for a learning environment where you, you want students to be calm and have their minds fully opened. And, um, and yet, again, my own daughter, despite all of my advocacy, uh, is in this setting. And I too, at times, wonder like, well, is this the number one thing that I should be raising with a teacher? Or is it the kind of thing that I need to trust her to her instincts and her judgment to kind of reconcile on her own terms? So how have you, re have you spoken to the teacher about it or does it make you feel precious to do that? Because you're a big believer in design for all, not design as a public luxury, design for public good. Yeah. So you'd be adv advocating not only for Maya, but for every child who comes through and possibly changing the mind of an educator who's so focused on these little minds that she's not seeing their environment. Yeah. She's not seeing it in the totality. She's not recognizing that a, you know, a ray of light shining on their little faces can make a difference. Yeah. So how did you handle that? We, I, I've yet to handle it, uh, I'll just say. Um, we, we are also in a, a, a kind of chronically underperforming or underrated public school in our neighborhood. Okay. It is, um, predominantly black, we are uh, very conscious of going into that setting. And honestly, I'm, I'm conscious of going into any setting and saying something that could come across as elitist, colonial, any number of other things. Yeah. But I am working up the courage. <laughs> Please do. So, so the, her teacher named Miss Minor is like, you know, she is just an absolute gem and Maya loves her. She's much shorter than me. She's potentially intimidated by me and I just want to like reflect back to her all the respect and admiration that I had for her when I finally had that conversation. Yeah, yeah, I understand. <laughs> well, when you do have that conversation, John, just remember that 
I totally get, and I, can, I have not walked in your shoes, but I know that for white men now, you do have, the mindful ones have to be very conscious about not putting down a big footprint. Yeah. By the same token, it is patronizing when you don't speak your mind. Right. When you yeah. assume right. that the person on the receiving right. end is going to be offended or they'll crumble or they'll yeah. might start a hashtag, which they very well might, yeah. but you are speaking to a greater good. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep in there. that in mind as well. I um, agree with you. Melinda Gates wrote a forward to your second book, Design for Good, A New Era of Architecture for Everyone. She said, almost nothing influences the quality of our lives more than the design of our homes, our schools, our workplaces, and our public spaces. Yet design is often taken for granted, and people don't realize that they deserve better or that it's even possible. This speaks to what Ms. Minor is dealing with. Yeah, it, is. Uh, it, it very much does. And so Melinda Gates, uh, who wrote that in her capacity as co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, has all the resources in the world and uh, is engaging with um, grantees and with other partners. And she just understands that she wants the best for those entities. Um, even more than the money, she wants them to feel human. She wants them to feel all the things that all of us want to feel about being respected, about being seen. And uh, I, I met her initially because I was asked to quote unquote educate her on design. There were four of us, all white men by the way, um, to educate her on design. And as we were going around the room, this big corporate CEO who was uh, at that time at the helm of a major office furniture company was talking to her very nicely. And she said, you know, I just need to stop you right there. She said, I know what design is. This is what design means to me. So all of you that were brought in to educate me, please like, you know, let's talk about something else kind of thing. Let's talk about design instead of you trying to tell me about design. Okay. And it just totally shifted the conversation. And so it, it made me really appreciate both her assertiveness and um, also the way this is, that she's experienced design uh, at Microsoft initially and now in the world. But she's been an enormous advocate. And even associating her with something like this subject matter is, I think, transformative in its own right. Your TED Talk, which is about a year old now, was so compelling. I just saw it for the first time last week. And it was so compelling that I immediately sent it to a friend who was in a similar situation that you and Courtney were in mm -hmm. at the time and said, heed this warning. Can you tell for people who haven't seen it, our viewers, what your talk was about in the beginning? Sure. I started my TED Talk uh, uh, talking, describing the birthing room where my wife, Courtney, gave birth to our first daughter, Maya. And we had toured the, the hospital in advance very responsibly, uh, and yet we still found ourselves in a space that we didn't expect. We were in a windowless room. We live in the Bay Area where it's like really bright and sunny and beautiful almost all the time, and we were in this room like completely disconnected from daylight. Mm -hmm. The walls were beige. It was kind of depressing in that regard. There were fluorescent lights beeping overhead, or uh, fluorescent lights shining overhead. I literally would have to like lean over her to try to shield her from the lights because they couldn't be dimmed in any way. And then there were all these like beeping machines. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's generally what most of us would expect a hospital to be. But it doesn't make it right, and it doesn't make it comfortable, and it doesn't make it dignifying. And so I talk about that experience that is not isolated to a single hospital in the Bay Area. It is kind of chronic across um, a universal experience across all healthcare environments, with few exceptions, and um, and so that was the the initial story that I told. What was the response to it? I'm guessing I was not the only one who was sending it out to expectant <laughs> mothers, saying, "Don't let this happen to you." Well, there's the old adage, "Know your audience," and I very much did in that case. It was the TED Women Conference, which was a thousand women and roughly ten men in this historic theater in uh, New Orleans. And so I wanted to share that story with them, but it also is such a central part of my experience and my story, in large part because my wife is both of those things and our daughter is also just so central to my life. Um, but the interesting thing is that we found ourselves 
uh, wishing for or wanting for a hospital that we had experienced earlier that same year in rural Rwanda. And wow. you know, this is on the other side of the world in a, what we would describe as a very resource limited setting. And I'm supposed to be in this first world country with quote unquote state of the art health care. And yet I saw a space in this other you know, corner of the world that kind of achieved more of what I would expect for healthcare to do, to make people feel cared for in the way that we wanted to feel cared for at that time. What was the name of that uh, hospital and what was their mission? So the, the hospital is called the Butaro Hospital. It's in a district of Rwanda called the Burera District that is home to 340,000 people. Less than a decade ago, there was a single doctor for those 340,000 people, and there was barely a patchwork of under-resourced clinics, so not even a hospital. And um, a group called Partners in Health, which is this global NGO started by Dr. Paul Farmer, um, uh, Orphelia Dahl, as well as Jim Kim, who's now the president of the World Bank, they had gone to Rwanda after having enormous success in Haiti and several other countries to bring health care to the poorest people in the world. And so um, with the support of the Clinton Foundation, they conceived of this hospital to be a new district hospital for this enormous um, population. And it turned out through a lot of kind of luck and circumstances that they met a group of young designers who could give physical form to the values that Partners in Health, as well as the Rwandan Ministry of Health, had for the kind of care that they wanted to provide for their citizens. What are your favorite places, whether domestically or internationally or in your head? You know, I, I can take, I can find joy in lots of different places. I spend a lot of time in airports and I, you know, work hard to find places of uh, comfort in, in those airports. If um, there's a beautiful one, give it a shout out now. Yeah, that, that's a little bit harder to pinpoint. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that the Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. Like, aspired to do some really unique things from a design standpoint. I think functionally, as it's grown, it's, it's been more complicated. Um, but I love going into bright, colorful, dynamic places. And they can be children's museums that I go to with my kids, or public libraries that have gotten some level of attention, um, or schools, or any number of other things. Uh, I also am very fortunate to, for the first time in my life, you know, in, in my mid-30s, was able to buy my first house. And it's a very modest townhouse type of a, a setup, but I just, I just worked hard to make that feel like the kind of life that I wanted to lead. And in that case, it was making it very bright and very clean and have lots of art and lots of color, um, as well as represent through the artwork all these people that are kind of part of my, li my mm -hmm. life. So you're intentional. Yeah, so I'm just very intentional about it. And that's, yeah. that's something that I would just advocate for, is that people do everything they can to be intentional about their spaces within their means. Even down to our socks. I love your <laughs> socks, John. <laughs> well, I love that you comment on my socks. I, yeah. I remember um, when I started wearing colorful striped socks, I was, I was speaking at a, a fancy event um, in Aspen, Colorado. And it was probably one of the first times in my life that I actually felt, in my life, that I actually felt a little bit objectified by people commenting on my socks. And of course, I appreciated the compliment, but it's actually the kind of thing that I think that I observe women get much more of that. And, uh, and you have daughters, so you know yeah. it starts when they're very, very right, young. Right, right, right. Right, yeah. right, right. So, anyway, but it is nice up. to see color yeah. in a man's exactly, ensemble. Exactly, yes, exactly. yeah, and I love the all dark look. We're in Atlanta now at the Museum of Design Atlanta, Moda. Mm -hmm. And you took a side trip on Monday. You actually led a group of 75 people, and I think some tagalongs as well, to the Memorial for Peace and Justice That's in right. Montgomery, Alabama. Why did you want to share the experience with people, and what has your takeaway been from the memorial? Well, the Memorial for Peace and Justice, as well as its partner uh, uh, entity called the Legacy Museum, is the work of Equal Justice Initiative and a civil rights attorney named Brian Stevenson. And that organization has been focused on the many injustices that, uh, that are outcomes of our, of our um, judicial system, but it gives physical form 
to one particular period, the period of lynching, which took place in, in uh, primarily in the American South, but all over the country, in California, Minnesota, elsewhere. And I wanted people to understand that legacy, and I wanted um, people to experience how these two spaces, the museum and this larger scale memorial, um, you know, could really, uh, could really bring those stories to life. And it, it was a phenomenal experience. I've yet to visit, but of course I've seen tons of pictures from the memorial. Yeah. And it's, um, the expression is so elegant, so minimalist, and so sleek. I wonder if we somehow are evading the message that lynching was very ugly, very messy, very violent. brutal, very violent, and yeah. barbaric. So how, how, do you, how do you guys even do that? How do you give expression to something that was so ugly and dignify it while making it a beautiful experience? Mm -hmm. And I guess a compelling experience is what I'm saying. So the, the Memorial for Peace and Justice uh, that is perched on this hilltop, the six acre site on this hilltop overlooking uh, Montgomery, was designed by an entity called Mass Design Group. It's actually set up as both an architecture firm and a nonprofit together. There's not that many of them in the country, but they are the ones that, that worked with Brian Stevenson and with Equal Justice Initiative to give physical form to this. Now, the, the beauty is they had the, they had the um, Legacy Museum, which is kind of a, a storefront museum space that did the work of telling of the horror, of the terror, uh, both in words and in some you know, sound, but as much with actual photos, people literally hanging from trees, and groups, sometimes 10,000 strong, standing around looking at these black and brown bodies hanging, and there were people of all ages, children, in fact, that you can see in these photographs at the Legacy Museum. And so, by the time, if you go to the, the museum first and then to the memorial, you get that sense of horror very quickly. As you then you know, go across town to the memorial site, there are words that are very, very thoughtfully crafted that express the kind of terror of that era. Uh, there are a few sculptures as you're entering onto this landscape of the memorial that express that terror as well. And then you go into the actual structure, which is about a 22,000 square foot space. And you may understand something, but it changes very rapidly as you go through the space. The most striking thing that I think hits people is that the memorial just puts a name to so many of these people. If you hear the statistic, a horrifying one, that 4,400 primarily African-American people were lynched in the American South. 4,400 is something that we can start relating to other tragedies of our time. Right. And you can put it in this like strange context that doesn't honor the humanity of those people or their loved ones or any others that were touched by that loss, crushed by that loss. And so you walk into the memorial structure and you suddenly see a name mm -hmm. and a county, and a name and a county. And you look at all of these columns that you're walking through, and they're filled with these names. And these people's names are being shared in public, sometimes for the first time. And uh, you go through these columns, and you start to realize that they're not traditional columns attached to the ceiling and the floor. You start to see the ground floor uh, go you know, lower from, from where you are, and the columns are suddenly, as you get to the end of the first, um, first side of this square structure, the columns are suddenly off the ground. Then you turn down the next one, and they are slow, they, they pretty gradually become over your head, and you realize they are symbolic of those hanging black and brown bodies. And then you turn to the third corner, and I remember when Oprah Winfrey was touring the memorial as it was just being completed, the construction of it was just being completed with Brian Stevenson, the founder of Equal Justice Works, and they turn the corner, and there's this gasp that she has, and that's a gasp that is probably heard with more people than not as they turn that corner, because you begin to confront 
not just these names that are right there in front of you and slowly hanging above you, but just the, the mass number of people. And it's just these, it's, it's more of these hanging columns, you know, that are symboli symbolizing these hanging bodies than you can possibly even count. And the other thing that they did that begins to kind of, be, that the other thing that they did begins to capture some of, of that horror is there are these, these steel panels with words in white on them. And it's oftentimes just a sentence. It was so-and-so was, was lynched because they knocked on the door of a white woman. Wow. It was so-and-so was lynched because they walked on the same side of the block as a white woman. It was, it's, it's, it's something as jarring as reading that combined with this physical experience of these, of these uh, masses hanging above you that creates a total otherworldly experience. And it's extraordinary. You've talked about the need for a similar memorial to memorialize the number of dead as a result of gun violence in America. Yeah, I, that, that is something that, that Mass Design Group and that other partners uh, like um, Everytown for Gun Safety uh, has, is pursuing as we speak. And so I do think that as we've seen on the mall in Washington, D.C. and many other places around Atlanta and all over the country, memorials matter. They help us heal and they help us not forget these times in our country or in our society or even in our town that, uh, uh, that we haven't been our best selves. In fact, that some among us have been our worst selves. Mm -hmm. And um, I really believe in the healing power of these spaces. Beauty is obviously important to you, not just in architecture and design, but in life. Why? Well, I think beauty is, is another manifestation of dignity. It is simply the kind of the sensory expression of, uh, or the visual expression of, of dignity. And we all know or have experienced moments where we have felt beautiful or not beautiful, uh, where we have held objects, whether it's a beautifully designed brand new iPhone or a computer or something else, or just some other product that we feel is special in some way. And it simply raises the question for me is like, why don't we have that same expectation for everything that we rely on day in and day out? And uh, why do we keep great architecture and great design simply for special occasions? Why aren't they more pervasive? Why isn't beauty more of a baseline expectation for all of us and for all people? I feel so lucky. You are our first guest on Collective Knowledge, so thank you for doing this. Of course. And if you can leave our viewers with three tips on what they can do to turn around either their workspaces or living spaces that don't make them feel seen, supported. Um, I'm gonna use your words because they're so perfect. The places where we work and live don't make us feel valued, respected, honored, and seen. What are three things viewers can do to make it better? Well, I think that they can trust their instincts. That's the first thing. And so if you are, um, if you know that you dread going to a place Take a look around and look at well, what is it about that place that, that makes you feel fear or, or discomfort and try to find other places that reconcile those things, that make those things better. I think that people also need to understand that they do deserve good design and that a better you know, built environment, better spaces are possible, um, that they're not limited to people with means that might have the ability to afford them more than, 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 that, than that said person. And then I think the final thing is just to make the spaces that we all live, work, and play in more fun, you know, more colorful, more vibrant, um, more full of life. And uh, those, I think those, those few things could really go a long way toward making a more beautiful and more just world. Thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing, for the thoughts you're putting out there, for elevating our expectations of what we deserve and what we can have. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, John. So nice to okay. meet you. You too. You too. Coming up next on Collective Knowledge, Susan Bennett, voice actor, singer, speaker, and 
the original voice of Siri. Siri was such an iconic thing. I mean, when she came out, she was the first concatenated voice that sounded human, and you could interact with her, and you could play with her. She had a personality, and people loved that. And so they would play with her and, and talk, talk with her. I was concerned about that because, especially with the movie Her, you know, they're talking to this AI and, and it's Scarlett Johansson. I'm going, well, <coughs> you know, they would expect her to be Scarlett Johansson and then her turns out to be, well, not quite Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> Don't forget to share this episode, like us, or send us a comment. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and please subscribe to our channel on YouTube.